Okay. Hi, Merlin. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, Lou. Good to see you. Nice to see you. Sophie, nice to see you. Sophie is uh, struggling with a little COVID, I think. Yeah, right? I'm, I'm on the descent into, into the COVID, it feels like. So if I'm a little <laughs> weary, it's because I have a viral companion. Yeah, so we, we, we're we happy she's joining us remotely. <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nicely. But um, um, welcome everybody. We're just going to take a minute. We're just going to chat and let let everyone get in, and then we're going to get right to it. The the agenda is. I'm going to. Uh, we'll have a few topics, and we're going to kind of pose the topics to Merlin. We shared that a little bit earlier, and. Um, just try to have a, a nice, you know, it's uh, it's November, so it's our season of gratitude. So we just want to have a nice, you know, positive conversation about um, the magic of the mycelium, the the value of storytelling, and and uh, some ideas that um, around how we learn from the mycelium for our healthy self to learn a, about how to be a healthy self. And um, I sharing uh, a couple of quotes and some some talking points that that Sophie has um, uh, that I drew from some of Sophie's work, and then kind of posing it to Merlin with the hope that Merlin might give us some insight on how some of this helps us learn to really adopt the ethos of the mycelium, not just the mushroom itself, but the the ethos and the the deep ancestral wisdom that we can uh, tap into. And then try to leave as much time for um, some Q&A and uh, you know, try to spend the, the 60 minutes really in a nice uh, engaged conversation. You know, So to get underway, so the magic of the mycelium. So the magic of the mycelium uh, as Merlin, you know, it, Sophie talks about it, that it's in the power of the smalls and the invisibles, and that sometimes perhaps we need to develop another prism, another view uh, of reality in order to see, feel, and learn from them, you know? And um, she talks about that the fairies are back, you know, and they have new names, viruses, microbes, fungi, moss piglets, dust seeds, and so on. And so it would be great um, in, in, in just to get your um, insights about that magic and how we might learn from it a bit, you know? Thanks, Lou. Um, yes, so, so many ways to go with this. I think a lot about magic as the arts of connection and, um, and viewed this way, mycelial organisms are uh, are thoroughly magical because they are all about connection, whether they're connecting with different parts of themselves or connecting with other organisms highly or all of that uh, in the most baroque um, and exciting ways. So um, as essentially connective beings, as beings that are um, mediating relationships in in in, in diverse and fascinating ways um i think they they fall into this kind of lens for thinking about magic of course there are many lenses for, for thinking about magic that that's just one that came to mind um because of the way that you you framed it but i think the sub visible the invisible making the visible making the invisible the sub visible visible um is um something else that's very powerful um, and we often do it through story when we're talking about fungi, because so much of fungal life takes place out of our sight. Even if you're a very advanced fungal imager with a massive research budget, um, what you see when you image fungi is rarely what they're actually doing in the busyness of the wild, wet world. And it's very hard to look inside the soil and see what fungi are doing. Normally, we see what happens when they grow on um, you no. Know, petri dishes in controlled environments or when we've already killed a root uh, and made it transparent by some chemical treatment um there's so much of fungal life that remains out of the reach of uh, even our, our most advanced equipment um and um and this is 
again, I think connected with uh, with this question of magic, because lots of um, what we think of as magic is that which happens in the places that we that that we don't intimately know that are uh, that are strange to us, that are foreign to us, that are unavailable to us, um, backstage, if you like. Um, and so, in these places, um, in the interstitial places or in the subvisible places, uh, there's a huge amount going on that that's difficult for us to comprehend. Um, on the notion of the invisible and the subvisible or the invisible, um, I think the question is that we think often of scale when hearing those terms, like the big and the small, but I think that the fast and the slow is also worth pointing out here that there's a time axis involved, which is why time lapse films are so astonishing because they play with that time, that temporal perspective, which also makes things which are invisible visible. Um, by compressing a time axis. We can do the same by slowing things down by with high-speed cameras, by, by stretching a time axis. Um, but I think that's one of the scales on which uh, we might need to play in order to to explore some of these places. Interesting. And, th and that leads to also the sensorial, right? That the, that one, well, even as a researcher as yourself who've had the opportunity to, to really get up microcosmically, you know, to the to these, to these, uh, to the fungi, still feel a great deal of it is is somewhat just outside of the perception, huh? Not, not still subperceptual. Uh, well, not necessarily subperception in principle. Um, I mean, you can imagine techniques. Imagine, 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 imagining a microscope before we knew about microscopes. You know, that would have seemed like a a, a very difficult thing to comprehend. I can imagine tools that would allow us to to reach these behaviors. Um, or at least I can imagine that they would one day exist, uh, because so many do, in fact, exist. Um, so subperceptual. It may be sub, maybe below the reach of our, our unaided senses, but 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 not necessarily in principle. Um, subperceptual. Yes. Yeah. Sophie, you have a thought on that? Yeah, I have a relatively blurry thought, but you know, I've been thinking a lot about Umwelt, which is Jacob von Uxel's idea of that there's a we, you know, you can be in a room with many different species and there are many different worlds within one world. That given our organism, our sensory apparatus, we have an experience of the world that is delineated by what we can sense. And I think about magic as being the edge. It's kind of like a photo negative of our sensory experience that we can explain everything we can sense. And then magic is just at the edge of what we can explain. It's just, it's that gray area that shades off into sensory experiences we can never access. And I've been thinking about this great quote I heard in an interview with this writer, Benjamin Labatut, who writes about the history of science. And he said, you know, one of the issues right now in our very human supremacist perspective is that we think that science can explain everything, but really what we're doing right now is we're getting better at asking questions we will never be able to answer. <laughs> um, and I thought that was such a beautiful frame, which is for me, magic is that mode, that interrogative mode that invites a structure to appear like the ripple you, you talked about the subperceptual that you know it, it moves the water it shows that there's something beneath but given our our bodies our matterful life we'll never be able to get back down to the, the, the smallest um root cause of that movement um, i mean we have instruments and we all have all, have all different ways of of somehow imagining ourselves into these universes. But I actually think there's something profoundly magical about the fact that we there are questions we can't answer. There are orders, there are, you know, filaments and things moving and bringing our the dynamic biosphere back into regulation that we with our, and this is where the temporal comes in, of course, which I love, we with our, you know, comet streak li lives will never be able to actually understand or see. Um, and so for me, magic is this profound humility about what we as organisms can actually understand. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. You know, it leads to um, this, this other kind of gateway into a topic, which is storytelling, you know, um, 
you know, our ancestors were storytelling. We we're all storytellers, you know, mm -hmm. and um, I think many of us are looking for content and looking for inspiration from the mycelium to to align with the mycelium and its wisdom to help us with our storytelling, you know, and, and to have good stories, you know. I was just wondering if, you know, Merlin, maybe maybe that might resonate with you in terms of in your work and in your inspiration and dedication to uh, the biology and mycology, you know, how, how you might demonstrate that for us a little bit with a story. With the story, um, there's one story that I found really helpful. It's by someone called Alan Rayner. At least his, this image, this analogy is his, and, and it stuck with me. And it was very helpful when I was trying to make sense of mycelial life um, and the possibilities that mycelial networks face. Um, I love so much this concept of the umwelt that, that you mentioned, Sophie, and find this very, very helpful. And um, one of the ways that I think about the umwelts of um, even other people, so uh, any any anyone who's not who I identify as me, um, whether it's a person or or, or more than a person, um, is to think about the possibilities that they face. Think about the choices that they have, the option, the field of possibility, the the, the possibility space that, that 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 confronts them, um, and the constraints that they act within in moving into that possibility space. And so this story from Alan Rayner, um, he, he says, um, uh, Alan Rayner, for those who don't know, is a, a, a very thoughtful mycologist um, uh, who's done a lot of work in thinking about mycelium and mycelial networks and fungal life uh, in, in, in quite um, profound ways. Um, he, um, he, says, he says, if you were dropped into a desert, say you'd been dropped out of a plane with a parachute and you had to try and find water, you would have to pick one direction and explore that one direction and try your luck. If you didn't find water after that walk, um, you would have to explore another direction until you did find water. But a fungus if dropped into that place, say as a spore, um, could grow in all directions at once. And when it found water or when it found food, it could thicken that connection um, to its food and it could withdraw from the other um, from the other places it had grown and uh, I think that's so that's an interesting way to think about you know, how, how decentralization um, permits exploration and um, and that's why I think that some of the most mycelial parts of ourselves are our minds because I think it is I think it is possible to explore in many directions at once in our minds uh, I think certain stories can help us do that say when we see for example from the point of view of many different characters when we think around a scene um, or if we're just trying to explore um, different ideas to work out what we might do um, so that's why I come back to uh, in, in, from 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 that um, from that story from Alan and um and I think it opens the door to many other possible stories, of course, about, about how we think about my CDL networks. Yes. yes. You know, it makes me, do you mind if I interject, Lou? Of course, no, please. Well, it makes me think, so I, I what I've studied over a long period of time is miracle traditions, the tr you know, healing and um, and the ideas of, of how in a different belief sphere, you're actually activating your immune system and experiencing real miracles. Um, and something I also think about is how, you know, in scholastic settings, it's called religion, but in the peasant class, it's called magic. And magic is always about survival. It's about trying to figure out what works. And when you were telling that story, Merlin, I was thinking about you drop someone, be it a um, mycorrhizal system, or a human being in a desert, and they're both desperate to survive. And right now, we are all in our, our you know, symbiotic connectivity, trying to survive our own ecocidal impulse. We're, you know, we're, this is right now, it's this high stakes question about how we are going to survive. And so it's interesting to think about storytelling and survival as being kind of mutualistically involved. And the best type of storytelling, the storytelling that's most 
liable to actually help us survive is the kind that isn't focused on a single narrative or a single outcome that can branch off and be messy and diverge and explore different options. And so I guess my question for Merlin would be, are there books, are there stories, are there musicians, are there artists right now that you feel like are playing at that edge? I think so much of art is, you know, lives at that um, edge. Um, and uh, in inviting us to consider possibilities, um, and sometimes by throwing open many, many doors to many, many possibilities all at once, and sometimes by closing um, many doors to, to, to reveal a, a more constrained set of possibilities. Um, an example that I always come back to that's really helped and guide my thinking about this is that as polyphonic music, and you find this in, in the choral traditions in the 16th century in Thales, Thomas Thales, William Byrd, um, Palestrina, um, Victoria, and um, and you found it in, find it in many traditional musics around the world, like the music of the Aka people in the Central African Republic, what we now call the Central African Republic, and um, where many, many voices can coexist and wind around each other these voices exist in the music uh, only in relation to the other voices but at the same time each one of those voices tells a story by itself it occupies a, a melodic space a melodic journey by itself um and um and you can have it in narrative as well and you can have situations in novels where there are many stories going on at once that wind and braid together um so these i found really helpful in in, in inviting my mind to stretch um, stretch to encompass these many possibilities. They're all un unfolding together in time. That's why the music's so 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 vivid for me because it's unfolding in time, um, in the same time um, uh, as the rest of itself. Um, so um, I think this is one of the music reasons why music uh, for me is is, is very powerful as a, as an art form is because it is a way of um, giving color to time, if you like, um, making time audible. Um, giving us a, a, a feeling for time, um, much as you would get a feeling for certain currents in liquid if you dropped in a, a dye into, you know, into a series of water currents within a big tank, um, as many do to demonstrate flow patterns. So um, I have a soft spot for, for, uh, for polyphonic forms. Um, and um, and there are poems as well, a poet called Robert Bringhurst, who, who thinks and writes very interestingly on, on polyphony. He, he has a series of poems where um, there are multiple, there's three human voices going on at the same time. Um, and it's really, you, you, can, you can listen to one or other of the voices, um, but if you just focus on one or other of the voices, it's very hard to focus on the other two voices that you're not currently focusing on. It's a bit like trying to listen to more than one conversation at a party. It's, it's hard you shuttle between them um then you then you, you sort of lean back and you hear all of them at once but what you hear when you hear all of them at once is not a normal flow of of, of a poem or, or, or of, a, of a sequence of thoughts um it's something quite different um so yeah so these are some examples of, of, of um of art that i think uh, invites me into a more mycelial space is your brother's uh cosmos is uh does he do this type of music is this part of his work because yeah he uh, does he, he does and, and he, he makes a lot of music give him a, a little uh prompt you know because of, of of this conversation of how we can learn from listening to sound you know as part of mm -hmm. our sound healing you know yeah he does he he um and he works a lot with sounds recorded in the, in the living world that um he then creates musical oh. sound worlds wow. with uh, or it, it's sound worlds where he sort of he steps into the sound worlds and then finds the music that's there um, in a very fluid and fascinating way. Um, but he also spent a lot of time just going into the world and listening. Um, and when you listen, you find, of course, that the, the living world is very polyphonic, both polyphonic and embodiment. You, know, you think about the life of each organism as a stream of embodiment. Um, think about the evolutionary history of each organism as a kind of stream uh, of embodiment and experimentation and improvisation, again, within a possibility space and constrained uh, by a set of constraints. Um, but when you go outside and listen, you hear it in sound. And, and sometimes you go out together, we have uh, we go out with some microphones, like a stereo pair of microphones, um, which you arrange you know, one and one and the other, but more or less the difference as your ears are, binaural microphones. And then you both put on headphones. And it's like a telescope for the ears. You turn up 
the the, the sounds of the world and and, and um Great. and you can hear things you never thought you would otherwise hear but it's uh you you fall into fascination very quickly that way just because more becomes accessible to you uh, and and the world um it turns out to be a very 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 polyphonic place perhaps that's a, a good message for those that are listening which is so many of us are looking to find our inner voice, you know, and, and be able to articulate better how we feel and how we express ourselves, which leads to being a good storyteller. So, you know, the difference between hearing something and really, as you say, Merlin, going out and really listening may be a great, a great insight to how we develop our, our, how we develop our inner voice, you know, and then become more expressive. Yeah. I wonder what Sophie would, um, think of the question of um, whether you think we have one inner voice or many because my instinct is that we would have many inner voices more like an ecology of selves um, that that sort of surge together to form the, the the sort of the impression of a singular self but really if we listen carefully to our inner voice we'd find many voices I wonder what you'd think it's a great question um, I am very interested in the idea of the pantheistic mind so I, I love the idea. I'm not saying if it's credible or not, although there are plenty of people who believe it is. And Merlin, you probably know about Julian Jaynes's work with the bicameral mind. Um, so for those listening who might not know about it, there is some reason to believe that we used to have, we used to hear voices. We used to, that if you look at ancient oral traditions that have been written down, in, in particular Homer, and you look at folklore, you see a very different type of mindset where, you know, the belief system is that both sides of our brain were literally talking to each other. And we translated that into a kind of animistic, pantheistic sensibility where the gods were elementals, they were speaking to us, we were hearing voices. And within our very narrow and very recent Western empiricist tradition, we characterize this as mental illness now, this kind of pantheistic mind as being psychosis. But the truth is that we've always been hearing voices and it doesn't matter if those voices belong to us or the gods or rocks or stones, they are part of that polyphonic chorus that precedes us. I mean, I've been reading a lot recently to me, you know, this is how I kind of balance the world's chaos as I read about the history of bacteria. Um, and I always think like, we're talking about sustainability. We shouldn't ask human beings, we should ask the billions of years of bacteria who knew how to just keep it, um, keep it going. Um, and I think about how we are, we are these conglomerates of bacteria. We were, we were, we were the fusion of two bacteria who half digested each other. Of course, we are pantheistic beings. Not only are we ecologies of mind, like we are e ecologies of, of species with their own divinities, their own mythologies that we'll never be able to access. Sometimes I think about the fact that I might have an impulse to go somewhere, to go visit a lake, to go eat a apple grown in an orchard across the river. And I'll go and do that thing, but I was really a vessel for a subatomic reunion I'll never even know about. That inclination, that somatic impulse to go somewhere, that voice, that inner voice that told me that I desired to go somewhere is actually material microbes in me wanting to go meet microbes somewhere else. So I'm just a boat um, for many different passengers. Yeah, that's my feverish ranting on that. What about you, Merlin? What do you think about that? Yeah, I feel like it's... Um... I feel a sense of, of multiplicity of voices in myself. Um, and so my instinct is to to think about our, our, our ego as um, just like the rest of the living world that we see as some kind of uh, summed, um, a, a, a diverse unit which sums into coherence and gives us the impression of coherence that we might uh, <laughs> that we might exist within it um, in a more manageable way, but really which is made up of um, many coexisting elements that somehow um, come together and are porous to one another and live in exchange with one another and um, and uh, create something which is more than the sum of their parts. So, um, and of course, that's what you see when you look on a physiological level, as you say, that there's no, uh, we're a community of cells um, and some of those cells are, are what we would think of as our own cells. Uh, and many are, are, are not. And um, 
And many of those bacterial cells that we carry on might have other bacterial cells within them. So if you think about the umwelts of that bacterium, yeah. um, and then the way that, the, think about all these overlapping umwelts, I guess, like think you know, the, the, even the umwelt of, say, liver cells, um, they overlap to form the sort of summed umwelt of a liver. Um, which is different from the you know there's the cells in a heart and the sums and belt of a heart um and so on so i think these um these nested um units of um of shared experience and orientation all add up to to what we think of as us uh, on a physiological level but i think also on a cognitive level yeah and i think it's so interesting for me and i work in um a lot with people who are considered neurodivergent or mentally ill in the disability realm. And I think of so many of the modes of consciousness that we problematize are actually more representative of that holobiont assemblage. Um, and that, you know, what if we could begin to accept that our minds are these, you know, constantly shifting brokered compromises between many different beings um yeah i mean one thing that i'm a little worried about is that we are fetishizing a kind of psychedelic openness so this very constrained medicated experience of of accessing that mind when plenty of people in psych wards are having it every day without having to order it off the menu can we kind of can we create more intersectionality between those two experiences um, yeah so that's just something i have curiosity about mm. there's a really moving passage in um in the book called the dawn of everything by oh, yeah. um, david graber and wengro and um they're talking about the newer people in south sudan and within this culture um there are um people who behave priests um who behave in a, a kind of in a way we think of as uh, as um, guarding and protecting certain types of ritual and practice um, there are uh, bulls who behave more you know, like say merchants or politician figures and there are prophets um, and prophets are, are thoroughly unconventional people that we probably identify as being psychiatrically ill in certainly in England or in, I imagine in North America um, and they might um, you know, rearrange sticks into patterns without any apparent purpose they might hang upside down they might talk in strange languages that make no sense to anyone else they might um, drool they might have unconventional sexual practices um, and yet when there are times of trouble the, it's to the prophets that the rest of the society would turn for new ideas um, because it's in these fringes uh, perhaps these fringes closer to the magical um, fringe um, of our collective and world, uh, that new ideas got to be found. And um, and it was such a difference to think about this, this penumbra of um, unconventional exploration rather than being pathologized, being thought of as, um, as, a, as vital to the kind of organism of society as it evolves through time. Yeah, I think, um, have you ever seen Maya Darren's um, work on voodoo practices, the Divine Horseman? Um, it's very interesting. It's all about possession and how certain cultures have know how to be possessed, but we in our Western culture don't know how to be possessed, which creates the anguish of mental illness. <laughs> and so I oftentimes think, and so the idea is that the gods come and ride you and you let them do it. And you've been, your whole culture has prepared you physically and psychologically for this moment of letting yourself be borrowed. And I sometimes think about how we don't know how to let ourselves be ridden by these divine horsemen, how, how, to, how to become mouthpieces for other beings. Um, and yeah, so I think with my art lately, I've been, just to circle back to what you were saying about listening, been trying to listen for, not my inner voice, but that voice that is a little scary, that's outside of me, that might want to ride me and possess me. And Roland, I guess I have a question for you, which is, you know, a lot of your work is highly rigorous and intellectual, but there also seems to be quite a lot of room for spirit and for poetry. What are the ways you practice, how do you practice listening and balance that with the intellectual and scientific rigor? I think, I probably try to do it by um, 
by seeing what we call the practices of science and what we call the practices of poetry and art as arising from a common place, a place of play, um, a place of exploration, a place of curiosity, a place of um, gratitude manifesting as a more sort of worship mm -hmm. and celebration. Um, and when seen this way, um, these practices are kin, they're sibling practices descending from a common source. Um, and they are you know, the scientific and the intellectual and the artistic. And um, and they may be, they may have different flavors and moods and associations and sets of norms. Um, but to see them as kind means that I, if I, when I see them as kind, I can, I can um, start to dissolve some of what seems to be very artificial boundaries that have been erected between them um, for, um, and seem to do you know, little more than, than, than um, create illogical barriers in our mind that make us feel strange and unusual and, 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 and weird and like we shouldn't be um, doing what we're doing. So, um, so yes, yeah, so that's one way um, is, is, to, is to just to feel, feel the place where this all just arises from, um, from my um, inquiring and um, grateful um, human, human spirit. And um, and that might look like um, a lot of the time it might look like reminding myself of, of, of the fact that scientists are and have always been human beings, emotional, creative, um, um, human beings locked in a dance with a wet wild world that was never made to be catalogued and systematized. Um, and so, so sometimes I need to remind myself of that fact, and, and I might do that in different ways. It might be by thinking about the life of a, of a scientist who um, turned out to be a, a, a wild mystic uh, and, um, and has been misremembered uh, as some um, coldly rational um, brain in a box. Um, or it might be by just listening to music. Um, and so, yeah, so, so I think a lot of it's practices of remembrance of, of, of what for me feels like a basic, um, a basic truth. It's a great segue into, uh, Sophie, the, the, the whole concept of the healthy self, you know, and how, how, how do we learn from the mycelium from stories and listening better to each other, listening, learning to listen better to the earth, um, to, to what is this healthy self? Because we're very conditioned to thinking what healthy is, right? And the, I think some of the the work you've been doing, um, both you know, challenged by health, your health um, is is becoming more of greater interest in terms of the way in which we perceive health and being healthy, right? Yeah, I mean, I, as someone who has a condition that is incurable, um, who has been abandoned by medicine, um, I have to ask what healing is available outside of our ideas of optimization and wellness and a healing arc that always ends with resolution and a return to a normative body. I'm interested in how the well body is really produced by capitalism. It's the body that can do work, that can get back to work. And so in a lot of ways, a sick body, an unhealthy body is an interruption in our ecocidal madness. It is, I say that to be correct, to be healthy is to be isolated and to be incorrect is to be relational. I was very inspired when I read Entangled Life about the story of the collaboration between plants and fungi so because for me metaphorically it was it's those absences in us it's those ways we aren't healthy aren't well the ways we are disabled that are open us up to risky collaborations with other people people with different ideologies different species and so for me it was a, a very helpful moment of recontextualizing the way my body didn't work didn't heal couldn't get back to normal as actually being this invitation to other beings to come and work with me um you know i spent a lot of time there's a lot of ghost pipe in the early summer which is a mycoheterotrope which merlin writes about so beautifully and it grew there's a huge patch of them 
nearby where I live and they're characterized as parasites um, because they, you know, they take all their nourishment from the russula that grow up right up next to them, these, these fungi. And I oftentimes think of myself as a ghost pipe. You know, it looks like if we're doing a quantitative analysis of what's happening in my life, in a lot of ways, I am fully parasitic on support networks and practical and medicine and all sorts of things that if you remove it, I'm gone. And yet there's something else happening. There's some interplay. There's, and yeah, so I've been really interested in how, well, I personally was interested in how mycoheterotrophy was really paired with kind of disability activism. And I would love to hear Merlin say a little bit more about his research into to those magical beings. Thanks, thanks for sharing that, Sophie. Um, yeah, what to say, there's so much to say about mycoheterotrophs. And, and perhaps for those who don't know, um, yeah, they 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 obtain their nutrients, um, both the, the mineral nutrients they need, like nitrogen and phosphorus, but also their carbon, so their energy source in the form of sugars or fats, um, from their companion mycorrhizal fungi. But those mycorrhizal fungi, in turn, re receive their carbon from other plants. So everything, all the stuff, the bulk of the stuff that you see, then you touch the body of this this plants. Um, many different sorts of mycohydric plants but you touch their bodies um, and the, the bulk of their bodies the carbon that makes up the bulk of their bodies this has come from another plant through a fungal network into them and um and so they are uh, they're wild in what they tell us about what's going on below ground you know because these networks are, are, are so inscrutable in in the way that they share and in, in the way that things move between them um, but in these cases, you know that because this plant has not got leaves and it's not got green you know, chlorophyll, it can't photosynthesize, that the only way it could exist is by obtaining its nutrients from other plants via fungi. Um, so, as Sevi says, the conventional story is that they're parasites because they're not able to give anything back in the familiar terms of the nutritional symbiosis. So, like, they can't, they don't have any chlorophyll, they can't photosynthesize, they've got no leaves they can't possibly return the favor to the fungus by providing them with carbon. So they must be parasites. Um, and they may well be in some situations. They may well be parasites in some and not in others. Who, who knows? There's lots of ways to be a mycoheterotroph. It's evolved independently over 40 times across the plant um, lineage. And um, so, but also I think we get very limited when we think about these exchanges in, 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 in these um just within the context of a single currency, say this nutritional currency, there might be other ways that the fungus is benefiting by associating with a mycohedrotroph. Um, that benefit might not be so easily measured in terms of fluxes of chemicals passing between them. Um, so I'm open to this possibility as well, uh, just because I don't want to foreclose the question, because I really love that question. I love that question being something that, um, that, I, that means that I don't presume to know what the terms of their relationship are before I've even begun studying them. Um, and despite having studied them, I still don't, I still don't really know um, whether that's true or not, because it's very difficult to design experiments to show that the mycoheterotroph is negatively affecting the fungus. It's just very hard to cultivate these plants and you'd need to do that kind of experiment to measure their effect on fungal fitness. So, um, so there's a wonderful openness to it. Um, I like that openness, and I think it reminds us of a bigger openness in the history of the study of symbiosis, which is that one of the reasons why the word symbiosis was brought into biology by Albert Frank, a kind of visionary, symbiotic visionary in the late 19th century in Germany, was because until this point, the only way to describe the intimate sharing of bodily space was in terms of parasitism or disease. And in his study of lichens, it had become clear that we needed words to describe the intimate sharing of bodily space that could be more than parasitism and disease. Um, and symbiosis was that word for him. This word symbiosis could include parasitism and disease, but it could also include mutualistic relationships where, where all the partners benefited from their association. Um, and so the big thought here was really, um, let's not assume that we know what they're up to before we've taken a look. Uh, and that's kind of how I feel about my heterotrophs as well, um, which is why I, I, I like to hold up on that question. Yeah, that's, that's great. Now, that's why, you know, like this whole notion of um, getting close to nature, you know, Sophie, you talked about, you know, this idea of, 
oh, you go forest bathing and you hug a tree and everything is about, you know, trying to connect with the pleasure of, of the forest. And at the same time, the, the, the forest, it makes you very uncomfortable, very, very afraid, lots of pain. You know, and so part of the journey to a healthy self is to be able to um, allow ourselves to experience pain and grief and healing in a way that is not comfortable, you know, and um, um, and that, that I don't, as a city person, I brought in New York, you know, nobody took me to the jungle, you know, nobody really took me by the hand and showed me how to camp under the stars, you know. And so I, I always feel somewhat traumatized by this notion of, oh, you go to the nature and take a hot spring, you know, and things that are just, you know, at the surface, so, so pleasurable, you know, and you write about that a, a little bit, right, in, in some of your work that we have to become much more open to the to the pain to get the wisdom yeah I mean I always I always problematize that nature is some kind of precious beautiful thing at a remove I oftentimes say like figure out where your shit goes when you flush the toilet like that's pretty natural mm -hmm. you know so not to be obscene but um I do think obscenity is a way of interrupting people's idea of the natural order of things so I call on it quite a lot um but you know, our shit is nature, our, the fungus in our belly button is nature, that when we're disabled or in a hospital and we can't leave, your sit, your body can be your sit spot. You don't have to go somewhere beautiful. It's there with you. You know, you can, the, the ways in which dysbiosis and viruses move through your body, is like a weather system moving through a valley, um, that we can begin to kind of compost these ideas of nature as being just pleasure, just beauty, just out of remove. And, but I do think what you're summoning, Lou, is this idea I often say to people is that when you've been living, when your hand has been asleep for a long time and it comes back awake, it prickles and it hurts really badly. And before you can access that hand and use it to do things again, you have to get through that threshold of a lot of pain. And we've been so divided from the fact that all of our shot arrows curve back into our own breast, that we are in an extended experience with our environments that we're harming. As we wake up to that fact, it's gonna hurt really badly. You know, a lot of grief as we realize that how much harm we've done to our extended minds and bodies. And so I do, I do wonder how we can kind of doula each other you know midwife each other through that threshold that's really unpleasant where we realize this is so painful there's so much grief there's so much physical pain yeah um i'm going to turn to some questions and i want to encourage um all of you guys this is your moment to ask some questions um, one question, Merlin, when Merlin does his experiments, experiments, does he sense the mushrooms can sense his presence? I think it depends on the experiment. Um, <laughs> there's, I mean, if we're doing an experiment in the lab, I, I work with a great team in Amsterdam and we have dishes of, of mycorrhizal fungi growing and we're doing in very controlled conditions, looking at the flows that happen within these networks which allow us to see on a micro, micro, micro scale, but a processual moment to moment scale, the internal behaviors um, as flow forms. Um, but in this case, you, you, you are totally shaping their environment. They are, they are, they are hundred percent doing what they're doing because you've invited them to grow in this particular way. And one of the problems is teasing out what they would be doing if you hadn't got them growing in a dish, but they're instead growing in the, 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 the complexity of a, of a soil so we're working with artificial soils trying to get three dimensions all this kind of thing you're always wrestling with that so in the sense that the fungus is doing what it's doing because of the environment you've made for it then i suppose it is noticing you or the extension of you in the form of this experimental situation um because it shapes entirely the way that the fungus will behave um i don't know that these fungi have a um a kind of sentience or a consciousness that would um i mean i think they don't have a sentience or consciousness that would make a figure of, of of me or my colleagues in their um in their experience um that they would then become cognizant of um 
but um, they certainly are cognizant in their way of their plant partners within the same dish because they're in a constant chemical conversation, striking up relationship, maintaining a relationship, dying to each other and being they reforming their connection. Um, those root tips die um, and then they reform a connection with another root tip. So um, there is a lot of noticing, if you like, that's going on. Um, that noticing uh, 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 is happening very much in their way. You know, it might not look like what we know by noticing, but um, they're sensing bodies bathed in a rich field of sensory information. Um, some of it, which reflects my decisions uh, and the decisions of my colleagues. That's nice. Yeah, guys, please, uh, if you have any other questions, just this is your moment to share. I'll while we wait for that. So Merlin, you're just coming out. Um, you're coming out. Well, you just published a illustrated version of your book, Endangered um, Entangled Life. And um, um, tell us a little bit about the photographic illustrative uh, motivation and maybe some credit to who's participating and contributing. Um, I have we have it now at the at the Alchemist Kitchen. It's a beautiful, beautiful edition, you know. Thanks, Lou. Yes, it's um. I think the idea is that uh, certainly the, the 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 idea that that's been with me for for um for a while with fungi and before the illustrated edition is is the idea of making the the visible the invisible visible what we touched on at the beginning, um or making the sub visible visible. And um, and so much of what we know about fungi comes from finding ways to look at them, finding ways to see them, um, literally see them, you know, make visible, um, whether through microscopes and version, different versions of microscopes, um, or by going out into you know, a forest or a field and, and looking at mushrooms. Um, and so much of what we know from experimentation is, is, is using the evidence of our of our sight. And the interesting challenge here, of course, this is something that happens all the time in biology and in, in, in the sciences and, and in so much of our lives that, that are not the sciences. Um, but, but the interesting thing with fungi is that they live so much of their life out of sight, buried in their environment, in their substrate. You know, mycelium exists uh, much of the time to immerse itself with whatever it happens to be eating, um, which means it's just inherently difficult to see. So our effort to see fungi um, and the difficulty that we face when we're making that effort, I think, sums up a lot about our journey with, with, with fungi and, and in a beautiful way, because it reflects on, on the ingenuity and persistence and patience and vision of so many researchers who uh, well, over the years have um, done their best to see um, within unseeable space. Um, and, um, and it also helps to explain why there are so many questions about fungi that remain unanswered. Um, and so in assembling these images, it was a way to 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 both bring fungi to life in the mind of, of readers, to invite them into the visual world of fungi, because that's a key step for anyone who wants to understand fungi is to see what there is to see. Um, and um, and another part of it was to reflect on on the, the artistry um, uh, and ingenuity and vision of of, of the many. Um, researchers who have dedicated their their lives to to uh, visualizing fungi um, and many of them uh, the many of my favorite are, are in this book um, wonderful um, microscopists and photographers and um, moving between scales you know and that's another piece is this idea of um, a lot of the arrangement of the book is putting the very micro with the more macro and you you suddenly can um, surge from a, a, a a microscopic image of a mycelial network into a forest scene um, and I like that unsettled feeling that you get when you move between scales I find it it sends me into a place of inquiry and, and confusion and helps me see both of the images um, anew and so that's another aspect of it that I'm playing with yeah no, very beautiful really encourage people to get in and Sophie you you want to talk a little bit about your most recent work, this Madonna's Secret, and your upcoming uh, work, just share it, you know, so people have a little sense of where your heart has been, you know, in terms of publication. Sarah, also just congrats, Merlin. Um, it's beautiful. I saw a couple, I, they stole the only copy of it at a local bookstore. So I kind of looked at it over their shoulders as they were um, looking at it. Um, and I, I think it's so important to also. You. 
So what? Okay, I, have, I have a coffee. Save okay, me. good. So when I come in, I'll get it from you. Um, <laughs> it's also, it, you know, we have to be seductive. We have to use the best attributes of the beings we're 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 working for, and they're they're good looking. They have they're they're great to look at. They're they're very photographable in some ways. Um, for me, I just had my novel come out, which is a eco retelling of the Gospels, kind of um, called the Madonna Secret. It's a novel, um, and I've been just bowled over by the response and by people reaching out. So it's been it's been really wonderful, and um, I'll be doing an event at, with you, Lou, in early December. Um, and if you want to listen to me do 40 different voices as a not professional voice actor, I did do the audiobook. And if you if you partake in libations, have a libation before you listen to me try and do 40 different male voices. Um, it was really goofy. Um, and I have an upcoming book, which will be coming out next year, which is um, experimental memoir nonfiction, which is about, it's called The Body is a Doorway, Healing Beyond the Human, Healing Up. Uh, healing beyond hope and healing beyond the human, which is really about, yeah, how do we access health when we're not getting better? Um, so I'm writing the last chapter of that like today. So um, yeah, thank you for asking, Lou. Of course, of course, no. We, uh, Merlin, any any, any uh, travel plans in the, in the, in the, the, you have research plan where you'll be do traveling or, um, perhaps visiting the states or what what what's what's on the near the agenda you know uh for you research wise or project wise i was um well i'm going to amsterdam next week to spend time with my colleagues there uh, which is always a treat um i was in um i was actually just in france in bordeaux talking to winemakers mm. about um, the role of the mycorrhizal fungi play in wine. Wow. Um, so much of flavor of wine um, is comes from the the type of grounds that the vines grow in. You know, there's a lot of uh, variation between wines based on on where and what soil that the vine is growing. But there's been relatively little thought about the the mycorrhizal part of this relationship, even though most of the minerals that enter the body of the vine and thus mm -hmm. the wine. Um, are going to be coming through a mycorrhizal association. So this was the beginning of an inquiry into ways to um, to think about wine as as um, well to think about the you know, mycorrhizal fungi in this very traditional way as a kind of the in the words of Albert Howard the way that a, a fertile marriage between the plant and the soil is achieved. Um, we could use any other kind of coupling metaphor if we wanted, but that communicates this this idea. And so it was a wonderful trip and and, and fantastic to to visit these. Um, these vineyards and these wineries and to taste uh, astonishing wines and um and think about these they must have, chains I, of association I, yeah they the, i would imagine that they also appreciated uh that that perspective right that the, these are people working with the tawa you know with the soil it must have been quite 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 wonderful you know a lot of fun yeah. yeah uh i have one last question here um um, by Sarah, from Sarah. Merlin, you spoke about imagining the microscope, microscope before it actually manifested. What might be at the edges of your imagination about the fungal world? Well, I mean, I have so many fantasies about what I would love to know, what I would love to be able to see. Um, and uh, or see or to, to, to not necessarily to see, but to um, to detect, to to observe, let's say, to observe, um, and um, and most of them involve being able to um, observe what a fungal community might be doing in the soil, strung between the roots of several plants, negotiating relationships with many, many, many bacterial types, um, um, and animals to get a real sense of the vibrant busyness of the soil um, and to be able to do that from the point of view of any number of different growing tips of the fungal network so to be able to see from kind of everywhere and nowhere and um, be able to see in the unseeable space of the dark dark soil where light isn't really an option for most organisms to use to organize their lives um, 
so it's a kind of impossible wish but um but that's 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 sort of my version of the 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 uh, maybe the impossible microscope that might have been difficult for someone to 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 think of before it came about um although then again it might not have been difficult to think of before it came about it sounds like the kind of thing actually that that one would find in a, a myth or or, or a, a fairy story a kind of the magical object that grants you the gift of seeing um seeing that which you can't otherwise see so actually maybe that maybe it's one of the easier things to to, to know before it came about i'm not sure hey merlin could you touch uh one one this is our one last question here is um just just a, a few words on the on how fungi and their biology are are inspiring ways that we may um heal the earth the remediation and the 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 science of, of fungi being now used perhaps as a as an ally as a tool for combating climate change and so on you know so certainly a lot of a uh, lot of a lot of work being done there just mm -hmm. to... well, i think there are lots of levels uh, which you can think about this there's a kind of conceptual level where fungi lead us into a more interconnected view of the living world by serving as poster organisms for ecological thinking by living their lives as uh, as networks that are constantly remodeling themselves um and i think that counts for a lot even though it might not itself be a direct techno application um and that they remind us also of the processual nature of the, the you know, of the living world that the mycelium is a body without a body plan that there's no sense in which it is ever fully grown um uh, unlike us of course all life forms are processes rather than things um but i think fungi make that again very very clear uh, also they remind us of the power of the subvisible the the, the the lives that lie hidden from us um to change the um to change and maintain the world around us and of course there are lots of more technological type applications and many of which are rooted in very traditional um, applications of fungi so fungal medicine for example has been around for a very long time and lots of organisms um, depend on fungi to maintain their health whether through the production of antimicrobial compounds um, uh, like well lots of fungi that live in plants for example help defend plants from disease by producing antimicrobials that prevent unwanted um, invaders um, so um, penicillin transformed modern medicine so Fungal medicine is a huge field, and the future of fungal medicine is even bigger and more exciting. The more we think about fungi, the more we can hope to know. So um, fungal medicine is one uh, way that we might think of a, 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 our ongoing future with fungi. Um, fungal disease, another, the kind of flip side. Um, lots of fungal diseases are on the rise, partly through our irresponsible use of fungicides. Our neglect of the fungal world means that we don't have uh, vaccines, like any vaccines against fungal diseases. Um, so. Um, so again, that can um, shape our futures. But those fungal diseases, at the same time, we could use to um, to kill, organ kill organisms that are a problem organisms for us. Um, and Paul Stamets has done lots of work, for example, with fungi that can serve as um, biological control agents of troublesome insects. Um, uh, there's other people working on mos malarial mosquitoes and how those might be controlled using certain types of fungi. Um, then there are all the ways that we call partner with. whenever we grow a plant we grow fungal relationships and there are lots of ways that we can deepen and expand our understanding of uh, plant cultivation to include the fungal partners um, to think about them as a collective um, outgrowths of ancient association um, there are fungal building materials that, that have been getting a lot of attention um, that we can use to replace damaging products like leather or plastics and all sorts of applications um there are fungal foods again a very ancient ancient aspect of our association with fungi but we could perhaps turbocharge this and grow the you know, healthy medicinal uh, a food source on agricultural waste that would otherwise be a problem these are just some examples i could go on forever but um but but they um yeah i do think it's important to see them as being part of this more ancient journey with funky and and and, and a sort of a deepening of, of of concepts and principles that have existed for a very long time so in our last uh 30 seconds or so um sophie and, and merlin you know it's our season of gratitude we we really would like to bring some attention to a social give back 
you know, I, I personally feeling uh, this season very, very motivated to try to encourage people to, um, uh, there's so many choices, but uh, if you guys could just give us one or two, you know, good organizations that are nonprofit that depend on small donations, you know, or doing good work, uh, who, who, who can we shine a light on uh, for just a moment today? You know, I I could say that, you know, please donate to any of the organizations who are, or, you know, researching Ehlers-Danlos Syndrome or connective tissue disease. So yeah, definitely. Um, that would be great, Doctors Without Borders. But honestly, just support local food growers. <laughs> Put your money into supporting people who feed the ground, who take care of the ground, who create the food, that feeds you and feeds other people. We need to start really creating mutual aid in our communities where we support the people who, who, who make our food and getting our food locally. I think it's as simple and as practical as that. We don't need to Venmo someone two continents away. Go and buy the food that is grown outside your door or grow it yourself. I think it's as simple as that. That's just my feeling today. It's lovely, yeah. Merlin, mm. you thought? Well, I think I would say the Fungi Foundation, which is an organization that does a lot of work with fungi to get fungi included within conservation frameworks that um, works to document traditional ancestral um, uses of fungi um, and uh, protect uh, traditional fungal knowledge, um, traditional fungal knowledge, and um, and is a, 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 a fantastic organization that, that I can... Um, that I, I work with and I, I support and I um I feel is doing really very good work in the world. Wonderful. On that note, hey guys, I'm so grateful to you both. Thank you so much. It's so inspiring. And I wish everyone a beautiful rest of November, a happy holidays. And thanks so much, Merlin and Sophie. Very meaningful. All right. Thank Have you. a great day. Thanks everyone so much. Thank you, Merlin. Thank you, Lou. Thank you. Thank you, Bye, everybody. Thank you, Lynn. Bye.